Okay, let's get started. Greetings and thank you for attending this month's science seminar presented by the NSF's National Ecological Observatory Network, operated by Vitell. Our goal with this monthly series of talks is to build community among researchers at the intersection of ecology, environmental science, and the M. So today, we are excited to have Drs. Quinn Thomas, Freya Olson, and Catherine Wheeler. Um, but before I introduce our speakers, um, I'll go over a few logistics. So we have enabled optional automated closed captioning for, for today's talk. If you'd like to use it, find the CC button in your menu bar. The webinar will consist of a presentation followed by Q&A. <clears throat> As you think of questions, please add them to the Q&A box. And we also have a meeting chat. Um, we use this to share links and other items of interest. Add speaker questions to the Q&A. We'll facilitate discussion at the end, and there should also be an opportunity to ask questions over audio. So if you would rather speak, we can do that too. Um, Nian welcomes contributions from everyone who shares our values of unity, creativity, collaboration, excellence, and appreciation is outlined in our NEON Code of Conduct. This applies to NEON staff, as well as everyone participating in a NEON event. The full Code of Conduct is available via the link that um, Samantha has shared via chat. And also on the bottom of, it's also on the bottom of the Science Seminars webpage. <clears throat> Okay, so this talk will be recorded and made available for later viewing on the Neon Science Seminars webpage. So, you know, if you're interested in revisiting it, it will be available there. Um, to complement our monthly science seminars, we host related data skills webinars on how to access and use Neon data. Registration for those is available on our same science seminars webpage. You scroll to the bottom. So here's the seminar webpage that's shared. So we have our schedule of talks. But if you scroll to the bottom, there's the data skills webinars. And it's coming up at the end of October. Um, Freya, one of our speakers here today, and Quinn, um, will give a data skills webinar on ecological forecasting. So um, more cool stuff about forecasting that, that you can check out there. <clears throat> um, lastly, if you have ideas for a great talk for the seminar series, nominate yourself or a colleague today by filling in the form on our science seminars webpage. So I'll show you where that is. We'll scroll up on the webpage here. There's this nominate a speaker button. So we take nominations at any time throughout the year, and then we have a panel that selects speakers for the next academic year um, over the summer. Okay, so I will introduce our speakers now. So today, as I mentioned, we have Drs. Quinn Thomas, Freya Olson, and Catherine Wheeler. So Quinn is an associate professor and data science faculty fellow in the departments of forest resources and environmental conservation and biological sciences at Virginia Tech. <clears throat> um, he was a postdoc at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research here in Boulder, where uh, the NEON folks are based um, before starting his position at Virginia Tech. Um, he's also the lead PI for the national, for the um, NEON, um, Ecological Forecasting Initiative Forecasting Challenge Research Coordination Network. Um, I probably butchered the actual name of that. Um, <clears throat> but this is their research coordination network focusing on um, ecological forecasting is what they're gonna talk about today. Uh, Freya, Freya Olson is a postdoctoral research associate in biological sciences at Virginia Tech. But she got her PhD in environmental sciences from Lancaster University at the UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology with a focus on lake management and the interaction between lake hydrology and water quality. And Catherine Wheeler uh, is currently a postdoc uh, with the NOAA Climate and Global Change, or is currently a NOAA Climate and Global Change postdoctoral fellow at MIT. Um, she received her PhD in Earth and the Environment at Boston University. And so I will turn it over to you all to uh, talk about the NEON Ecological Forecasting Challenge. Oh, you're muted, Quinn. There we go. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Eric. Can you see my screen? Yes. 
Yes, great. Um, so uh, uh, Freya, Catherine, and I are really excited to uh, be here and share um, kind of the framework behind the Neon Ecological Forecasting Challenge, uh, as well as results from that. And we'll be tag teaming this uh, this seminar um, as a kind of a coherent whole. It won't be just three unique seminars. Um, and so to start, we uh, you know, the broader context is that you know decisions are being made in the context of a rapidly changing environment. These decisions relate to all kinds of ecosystem services and you know human ecosystem, human environment interactions, things like algal blooms and endangered species, fisheries, water supply, even uh, for you know forecasting when the fall colors are going to be great for looking at the leaves. All these decisions are being made, um, whether we have kind of good information or not. And the goal of ecological forecasting, you know, is to kind of help provide information so that decisions can be made to guide uh, us to a world like on the far right, where where we want to be, um, you know, uh, you know, as humans. And so. This sort of brings this idea of, of basically predicting nature like we predict weather. Um, the idea of, of taking the observed world and interacting with models to provide actionable information. And the ecological sciences are undergoing a transformation uh, similar to what meteorology and weather forecasting you know, has done over the past uh, multiple decades. And to provide a little bit of context, I wanna highlight how a, a weather forecast comes to be. Uh, it starts with a, a, a numerical weather model that represents the physics um, of the kind of atmospheric system. And that model is run. Um, uh, and then data it is then brought to bear to help adjust to make that model as consistent with the real world as possible. The data comes from diverse sources of diverse quality, but that data is not all things in the model everywhere. And so that data is used to adjust both the things that are observed and unobserved to be as consistent with now as possible. That updated model is then used to uh, make a forecast that is initiated at our best guess of where it should start into the future. The output of that numerical model is then translated into decision support to produce what we commonly think of as a weather forecast, things like highs and lows and probability of forecast, things like that. And the real revolution in weather forecasting has come from uh, multiple parts. The first part is improvements in our ability to model the weather. The other is our improvements in our ability to observe the weather. And then finally, our ability to combine models and observations. And so that's really accelerated the process of weather forecasting. And the ecological sciences are really um, in that sweet spot now where we have rapid improvements in our ability to model, improvements in our ability to observe, and our abilities to combine models with observations. And that ability to observe is a central component of uh, the advancement in forecasting and really highlighted by the rise of uh, our ability to sense all kinds of aspects of nature, which is you know, um, really, uh, you know, neon is a great example of that. And so ecological forecasting you know, is a growing field. Um, you know, here we define a forecast as a prediction of the future with uncertainty. And you know, there is um, you know, uh, an increased adoption of best practices and those best practices on how to produce, represent, um, report, evaluate forecasts um, are, you know, we need those for inner comparison and some best practices are really being brought to bear and, and there are a lot of gains in that. Others um, we need to uh, continue to approve upon um, as a community um, to ultimately help us realize the potential gains from ecological forecasting to help benefit um, our understanding and ability to um, manage ecosystems and environmental systems. And so what we need are more intercomparable forecasts from a diversity of perspectives and approaches that engage more partners. This will allow us to fulfill the kind of the, the, the dream of what ecological forecasting can do for society. And so to address this um, goal, um, we've, there's, we've kind of brought these two organizations together 
The first is the Ecological Forecasting Initiative, which is a grassroots consortium aimed at uh, building an interdisciplinary community of practice in ecological forecasting. This group was really launched um, in 2019 and you know, has grown to be uh, quite a large and active group of folks who are really engaged in forecasting from all different angles. This isn't just folks running models on their computers. It's people who are really interested in decision support and education and DEIJ and um, many aspects of the, the forecasting enterprise broadly. And the other is NEON, which you know most folks here are probably familiar with, but it's the standardized terrestrial and freshwater data that are with ongoing collection that are freely available across the US. And so uh, we created um, the uh, NSF sponsored e uh, Ecological Forecast Initiative Research Coordination Network, which is a five year project that with the goal of creating a community of practice that builds capacity for ecological forecasting by leveraging NEON data products. And that project, um, you know, we're still in the middle of this, um, uh, you know, the, the, the window of this project. And what really excited us about this uh, ability to, to kind of focus the research community on NEON data and a very practical kind of touch point. And to do that, um, well, for, first of all, I'll introduce the um, steering committee of the project. Um, that has been working together to really make a lot of the decisions and uh, community leadership behind the scenes. And so the, the platform that we really developed to um, kind of focus the community so that folks are forecasting the same things, we're talking the same language, we're sharing the, the, the and co-developing the same tools is this neon ecological forecasting challenge. Um, and uh, there's a paper that came out this year in Frontiers Ecology and Environment that's a very short uh, paper that describes a challenge. But what the challenge is, is it's a platform um, that both challenges, as in sets the, the rules and the cyber infrastructure and you know the, the, the ways to engage and empowers by providing the training and the tools um, and the community to submit iterative, which are repeated forecasts of uh, near term, uh, which are kind of uh, day to kind of year ahead uh, forecasts of yet to be collected neon data. This is neon data that not even neon folks know what it's going to be because it has yet to be uh, collected. So it's a genuine test of our forecasting capacity. And this talk is really going to focus on what is a neon forecasting challenge? What are the elements of a forecasting challenge? And uh, some kind of uh, results from running this challenge over the past few years. And so I wanted to really start with this diagram um, that's in the paper about the challenge. It really highlights the components of what uh, an ecological forecasting challenge involves, where you have the kind of the inputs to the challenge being data, um, also you know, inputs from kind of weather forecasts and inputs from the community through training and templates and how all that kind of feeds through to produce a, uh, a whole catalog of forecasts that we can analyze and understand patterns of predictability. Um, so I'll start with uh, you know, the, the data behind the forecasting challenge. And you know, uh, that builds off the NEON project. And you know, uh, to, to summarize, it's, it's 81 sites. And you know, as of when I last checked, about 182 openly available data products standardized across sites with a planned 30-year horizon that really kind of had its completion um, total completion in, in around 2019. Uh, really importantly to this challenge to be able to compare forecasting capacities across system and scale are the fact that it's measuring both aquatic and terrestrial, physical, chemical, biological, population, community, and ecosystem dynamics, which uh, allows for us to really um, do some really powerful synthesis of our forecasting capacities across these different ecological systems and scales. And forecasting is kind of fundamental to uh, NEON's mission. You know, the NEON strategic plan from 2011 um, talks about NEON's goals. And you can see that um, forecasting is very clearly highlighted in two of the you know, three goals here um, that, that NEON has really sought out to. Yet, you know, NEON has really focused on de developing robust data products for the community to use. 
And we view this neon ecological forecasting challenge as a way to help neon achieve its mission of, of the underlying forecasting component um, that's very uh, predominantly highlighted in its um, mission. And so starting from neon data, that neon data is that we download that and standardize that as time series um, using automated kind of workflows that are occurring every day. And those time series are specifically designed to be um, you know, really easy to work with in a variety of, of modeling frameworks. And we call that the target data. Um, the target data really came out from a community design process. Back in May 2020, uh, we had a virtual meeting of you know, well over 100 participants. And um, you can guess that, that that virtual meeting was originally a, uh, you know, an in-person meeting, actually supposed to be in, in, at NEON headquarters that we had to transition. Um, and it turned out to be a real um, you know, uh, opportunity to really engage a much larger group of folks. And during that meeting, there was a lot of discussion about what it would be the most exciting NEON data products to forecast. And folks really narrowed down on these kind of four kind of areas of interest um, being natural climate solutions, things like carbon storage, water quality, uh, biodiversity conservation, and infectious disease. And then the community kind of came together and decided on these uh, focal themes, which are the, the five areas that we really, that we focus the forecasting challenge on. Um, there's an aquatics theme that focuses on forecasting temperature, oxygen, and chlorophyll A at the one to 35 day ahead horizon across 34 sites. And data becomes available to evaluate forecasts within three days of it being collected. And so um, that's the three day latency. Um, we have the tick larval abundance of one to one, one week to one year ahead across the 47 sites. And that has about a six month latency due to the time required to identify um, uh, the, 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 and count uh, the ticks. There's a carbon and water flux team that's the one to 35 day ahead horizon. And you may ask where the 35 day ahead horizon comes from. And that's because NOAA uh, produces a weather forecasting, an ensemble weather forecasting product that runs out 35 days ahead um, that we make available for folks to use. So the carbon and water fluxes is from the flux towers um, at the one to 35 day ahead at the 47 sites. And that has a five day latency between data being collected and made available to either train your model and evaluate um, past forecasts. There's a beetle community richness that kind of parallels the tick uh, where it's the a one to year ahead forecast uh, across 87 sites um, with a six month latency. And finally, the phenology one, uh, one to 35 day ahead at the 47 terrestrial sites. And that has a uh, near one day latency because of the way that the phenocam data is made available um, uh, in, in near real time. And so after these were decided, the uh, teams got together as the design teams and really discussed all the small decisions that matter on how you convert NEON data into a kind of a standardized time series um, of these particular um, data sets that people wanted to forecast. There was a cyber infrastructure design team that, divide, that designed the automation to run the forecast behind the scenes, a working group focused on the standards for, for, of how to save the forecasts um, column names, things like that. And then partnerships, folks who really were invested in um, the, the forecasting challenge that had a, a 2021 launch. And over 600 folks in this entire process have been involved across the globe. And this gives an example of a, of a time series. You know, th here is a file that you can read in from a stable URL to get kind of the most up-to-date uh, aquatics. Th this actually for uh, a site in Florida that has both an aquatic and a terrestrial site. And you can see the, the time series of the different things that folks are trying to forecast um, as part of the forecasting challenge. And importantly, this data is becoming available every day as soon as new data from NEON become available. So you're always able to use the latest information to train your models or update your models. Um, and then you can also, uh, we automatically then Say your forecast two weeks ago of today's data, today's data comes in and we automatically evaluate your forecast with the, the new data. And what's really great about this is that because the forecasts are by definition out of sample, um, because the data has yet to be collected that will be compared to, the organizers uh, can be really involved in the forecasting challenge because there's no holding back data that we've seen 
that others haven't. And so it allows for the folks that are excited about organizing it, who are most, who are really interested in being engaged, you know, actually doing some of the forecasting themselves. And so to support the challenge, because in many cases, uh, the a, a forecast may want to have what we call covariates or drivers. Um, uh, we make numerical weather forecasts from uh, from NOAA available really easily to teams. And we created an R package called uh, Neon Forecast, where you can provide the date that you want the forecast to start, the site, the variable, um, you know, and be able to download from our, our cloud storage a time series of a future forecast of weather for um, a particular site and use that as input to your forecasting model. And we're doing this automatically behind the scenes every day. So you actually have available to you all the weather forecasts that have been generated for NEON sites since um, the fall of 2020. So you can sort of you know, calibrate your model in that way as well. So um, to help folks contribute to the challenge, we really emphasize build the uh, training and templates, with training being workshop materials, um, also going to where folks are, meaning like going to ESA or going to, to meetings where folk that aren't necessarily focused on forecasting, but have people who are domain experts who might want to engage in forecasting, and also templates, meaning that like GitHub repos, repositories, or, or other materials where folks can kind of plug in their ideas, but they don't have to worry about all the other infrastructure associated with submitting to the challenge. And some examples are, uh, we ran a uh, training session at ESA this, this past summer, Ecological Society of America meeting, also the Global Lakes Ecological Observatory Network, uh, Freya ran a training session. Um, it's been, it's underpinned uh, multiple university courses as the project, which it's an incredibly awesome project because you get your class forecasting early in the semester. Their forecasts are actually getting evaluated. They can learn how well their models are doing and update their models. And so this iterative learning cycle is really, can occur within the course of a semester long class. And because all the cyber infrastructure behind the scenes is automatically accepting and scoring forecasts, uh, the students don't really have to worry about that part. They just have to get excited about building models and learning from uh, those models. We provide templates and tutorial code. Um, and we also, um, you know, the, this work uh, paper by Alyssa Wilson really thought about how we can then uh, address the um, opportunities and inequities in undergraduate education and broaden participation in the forecasting enterprise, um, uh, you know, writ large. And in fact, you know, this is an introduction or a, a plug for the upcoming um, NEON uh, data skills webinar which will walk you through how to submit a forecast to the NEON Ecological Forecasting Challenge that isn't just about the nitty gritty of, 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 of forecasting the at, you know, particular challenge, but it's also teaches you kind of broad concepts in ecological forecasting um, that you need to know to kind of really think about what it means to produce a forecast and interpret a forecast. And so this is a great training opportunity in that area. And so you can register here. Um, if, if interested. We, we, we really um, invite you to come. So the folks, teams start submitting forecasts using the training and the tutorial. And importantly, because one of the best practices in ecological forecasting is to compare to a null or baseline model that represents um, kind of some sort of rudimentary um, understanding of the system that we, we start generating those. Um, and um, all together, when you combine these like baseline nulls and the forecasts have been submitted by the contributors, we are up to nearly uh, you know, over 23,000 forecasts submitted by you know, over 200 teams. And you can see that this is spread across uh, you know, the different themes, um, both on the right, which is the number of teams, and on the left is the number of forecasts. The number of forecasts is so much more than the number of themes or number of teams that's on the left is because of this iterative nature. Each team can submit forecasts every day. Um, and for the one, one day at a time forecasts, the total number of forecasts ends up building up over time. But we've had kind of wide engagement um, and we've been really excited to see these numbers um, contribute to the forecasting challenge. 
And so one of those is these baseline forecasts. And here's an example of the baseline forecasts. There's two that we automatically submit that everyone can compare their forecasts to, which is um, what we call climatology, which is the historical day of year mean of the neon data um, at that site. Um, and persistence, which is tomorrow is the same as today, plus some random noise, it's sort of like a random walk. And here's just an example of one of those, uh, th those two um, kind of null models for water temperature at one site. You can see that, you know, the, the red being the climatology, which has a sort of constant spread over the, well, over the forecast horizon, which is the, the time period in the future. And then the random walk is kind of gaining spread over the course of the horizon as we move further and further from um, you know, today. And so these two don't have a lot of ecological knowledge embedded in them. And so they represent kind of null models um, to ask whether adding more complex uh, knowledge or models actually builds on top of these kind of baseline assumptions. So these forecasts are coming in and we're building up this big catalog of forecasts that we are uh, scoring and develop summaries for so folks can look at how for, uh, forecasts are performing over time. And to get there was the development of these standards um, that are available uh, at the preprint link here and is a paper that's accepted in Ecosphere led by Mike Dietz, where the standards of how we format the targets files and the format files really allows for the automated uh, scoring um, as new data comes in. And we focus our scoring on, and a score is basically how well a model, uh, a forecast and a data point compare. And we focus on the continuous rank probability score as our metric because it emphasizes both the ability to uh, predict the, the effect, the mean behavior, but also capture the uncertainty, um, that the forecast uncertainty is robust. And I'll highlight what I mean by that. So for example, uh, here is a, an example of a kind of an isocline of a score, meaning one of these lines, this line, like say right here, is a score of one. And this is a forecast where the forecast say, here is I say, I forecast that water temperature is gonna be eight with a standard deviation of say four. And then the obser observations come in. And the observations were eight. That forecast did great predicting the mean behavior of that observation. And so you could call this a bias of zero and a standard deviation of four. But a standard deviation of four is, a, is quite uncertain. You know, it says that I'm not very confident. I guess the middle right, but I wasn't very confident. And so you can actually score better by having more confidence and balancing that against the bias. For example, Say I was a little bit, uh, my prediction was a little cold by a degree and a half, but I gave two degrees or two standard deviation units. And you actually drop down because here's the standard deviation here. You actually can drop down a unit, a half a unit of scoring or so uh, by actually better representing uncertainty. And so this type of uh, forecasting score really allows us to capture the, you know, this tenant, this uh, important tenant of of uh, the ecological forecasting uh, initiative writ large, which is the importance of representing uh, uncertainty in a forecast. And so we focus on this continuous rank probability score metric as a way uh, to really uh, capture that ethos. And so those scores are, again, this, is a, this database is building up every day in real time. And those scores are made uh, available for real-time analysis of the submissions through a dashboard that's available uh, for folks to look at and see how their forecasts are doing. And as those scores build up over time, uh, they become available um, for us to really think about synthesis um, and combine them together and do the analysis. And the real power of uh, the NEON project is that we can really focus the synthesis on a lot of different questions. For example, how does our forecasting capacity vary across ecological system. NEON's collecting all these different data. What about site? There's 81 sites. Um, time of year, the data is continually being collected. Modeling approach, we can um, solicit a lot of different approaches, whether it be 
regression, simple regressions. We have our baseline models. We have, you know, people are submitting machine learning models. We have process models, which embed kind of mechanistic understandings of how the system works. We have models that combine multiple different things like, you know, a, um, a machine learning and process model combined together, or even models that just aggregate other models. Um, all of these things can be compared. And also we can think about lead time. How good are we one day ahead? How good are we a month ahead? All those questions that we can address with, the, with this catalog of forecasts that's being built up over time. And so uh, we, we're gonna focus here on examining the catalog of forecasts to kind of better understand our uh, forecasting capacities for these two themes here, phenology, which Catherine will talk about, and the aquatics theme, which Freya will talk about. And so I will hand it over to Catherine. Can you guys see my screen all right? Cool. Um, yep. so I led the first round of the phenology forecast challenge, where in the spring of 2021, we focused on just forecasting greenness at plant canopy, eight deciduous broadleaf forests in the neon domain, shown on this map to the right. And we had people pre um, submit over 192,000 predictions of greenness. And we had over 40 participants in the challenge, and everyone who participated were able to were offered to become co-authors on our manuscripts and those co-authors are listed here. And we have a preprint available if you are interested. So we were able, as Quinn mentioned, we were able to quantify and measure phenology using phenocam data, which are just future phenocams or digital cameras that are positioned to point at plant canopies and take repeated images of these canopies. And then you can analyze these images for the percent greenness and see how that greenness changes over time. So here's an example of phenocam data, um, greenness data that's collected at Harvard Forest for 35 days at mid-May of 2021 through mid-June. And we were able, and you can then also analyze these cur these data to be able to determine what days the canopy has 15% greened up, also what days the canopy has 85% greened up. And then these are some images of the phenocams to give you kind of a visual of what 50% green up and 85% green up is. And then if we look at, these are some example forecasts of models that, that submitted forecasts for this specific day. Um, as you can see, we have this in this red, we have the day, day of year mean null model, which Quinn talked about. And that has a pretty wide confidence interval, um, but it was able to really ca include most of the observations. Some other models had really narrow and maybe were too, were, were too slow, but overall, most of the models, at least in this example, kind of show that greenness is going to be increasing during this next month at some point. And we were also really interested in how the skill is changing with based off of lead time. Um, so here we have the CRPS for the different lead times on the x-axis minus what the CRPS was at lead time uh, of one day. And positive values indicate that it's worsening with lead time, with longer lead time, and negative values indicates that it improves with longer lead time. And overall, we see that most model classes, so we have the different models characterized into different classes, which these different colors represent. Most of them are, the skill is worsening with longer lead time, but we actually did see one model class that includes covariates. So models that include stuff like the temperature is actually um, slightly improving with longer lead time, which could be because they are becoming, um, could be because the certainties are changing over time. We were also really interested in what these, uh, which model classes performed the best and had the highest skills and how these really compared to the day of year mean model class. So here we have the CRPS value of the model class or the model minus the CRPS value of the day of year mean. 
And these positive values over, uh, to the right of this line indicate that it's the model is performing worse overall throughout the spring of 2021 than the day of year mean. And then the once the right indicates it performs better. And as you can see, there's only one model, this green bears par, which um, is a day of year plus kind of historical average of photosynthetically active radiation model. It was the only one that performed better than the day of year mean across the whole, all the sites in the, in the entire forecast period. Um, and then, but we also then ranked them by classes, which the class averages are shown by these vertical colors. And the day of year mean performed the best of all the different model classes. And I think this is really important because Quinn mentioned that the day of year mean doesn't have a whole lot of ecological by basis to it, but with phenology, phenology can be very is can be very driven by photo period, and photo period does not change, or it is the same for each day of year. So day of year mean is such a really is a really strong null model for phenology. We we're also interested in where forecast skill was the highest. Um, so this is showing for different sites um, and kind of like the site predictability CRPS on the y-axis and with CRPS higher values indicate lower skill, lower values indicate higher skill. And this is versus the day of year of the 50% green up. So when the canopy is 50% greened up. And we've found that based off of this specific year and these specific sites, um, earlier sites had much higher skill and later sites were much harder for us to forecast. And then finally, we're really interested in what part of green up is the skill lowest. So we standardized all the forecasts based off of what, what date they're forecasting and how much that forecasted date is different from that site specific day of 50% green up. So that's shown on this X axis where negative values indicate that these are forecasts of days that are, ended up occurring before the canopy had started green up and positive ones indicate that, say this 20 indicates that they were forecasting a day that occurred 20 days after the canopy had hit this 50% green up. And then we looked at this for each of the different sites, um, which are shown in these different colors with the overall shown in black. And then these vertical stripes indicate the days of 85% green up. So you can kind of get a sense for if these days of 85% green up are pretty high, then green up takes a lot, a long time to green up. And if it's and if it's short, like these um, green and blue over here, then it means that it greened up really fast. And we found that across all the sites, um, the predictability was highest during the winter, which makes sense. It's not green. All the models forecasted that it wasn't green in the winter, but that the skill was lowest at the very end of green up. So right past these days of 85% green up. So in the future, we're using these conclusions to hopefully improve the models and know that they're, they're pretty bad at forecasting late green up and the end of green up, but then also inform all hypotheses in these other rounds. So we were added, so we've added more um, sites because we were really into the, these site differences, but we didn't have a whole lot of sites initially. So we're just using these to create develop hypotheses for future rounds. And I'll pass it to Freya. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna give you a bit of a uh, more preliminary work that we've started on the aquatics theme. Um, Catherine's done some great work with the uh, phenology and we hope to uh, replicate some of that and learn some more about our aquatic sites as well. So in terms of um, what data we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at this year's uh, forecasts that have been submitted. We've been making a real push to get more engagement with our aquatics theme and it's been really successful, which is why we're able to do this. Um, we're going to be looking at all three of our water quality variables that we mentioned, the water temperatures, dissolved oxygen and chlorophyll A. The theme covers all 34 sites. So this includes seven lakes and 27 rivers and streams. We've been able to collect 43 different forecast models, um, accounting for almost 180,000 individual forecasts at each of these sites. Um, we're hoping to run this until the end of the year and do the synthesis on a, on a full year of the 
of the forecast submissions. Just to give you a bit more context, uh, not all 43 models forecast all variables at all sites. Um, we do see a bit of bias towards water temperature forecasts um, with most of our models um, forecasting water temperature. Only nine of our models do not forecast water temperature. These are generally uh, process-based models for chlorophyll. But we do see 18 models that forecast um, all three variables, which is really exciting. Um, we also see quite a distinct bias towards uh, lake forecasts, um, with 17 of our forecast submissions only forecasting the seven lake sites. Uh, again, this is a bias towards uh, process models that are specific for lakes. Um, today, I'm just going to show you some preliminary analysis from the water temperature forecasts in our lakes. So just as an example forecast of the types of uh, um, models that were getting submitted, these are forecasts from uh, late August, uh, each of the colored lines representing a different model, different team, and our observations of water temperature uh, shown by the points. These are our two lakes in uh, Florida, Barco Lake and Suggs Lake, and the water temperature forecasts. Um, just wanted to highlight just a couple of the different model types that we're getting submitted. So we have these process models, um, such as Flare, uh, GLM, and Gotham. Some empirical models, including a lasso and a, a linear regression. We also have some machine learning forecasts being submitted, including uh, random forest, and a number of multi-model ensembles, which combine forecasts from um, a few different um, forecasts. We can evaluate these and look at their skill relative to our null model. So again, as Catherine showed, uh, the negative values indicating better than a, the climatology null and positive values indicating that the model is worse than the climatology null. The forecast here for um, Suggs Lake show that we have much, uh, we have much more skill um, than the climatology at shorter horizons, but after about 15 days, there are few, fewer models that are able to um, do better than climatology. For Suggs Lake particularly, we see that um, the profit model and the random forest do particularly well across the full forecast horizon outperforming climatology um, for all 30 days. <clears throat> Looking at which model class um, does better, this is across all of our lake sites, looking at water temperature, and we see that we have a number that uh, outcompete climatology, and these are dominated by our process models and our machine learning. However, this is not always consistent across sites. So if we break this down by site, what we see is that uh, the skill is variable across sites with our prairie lake and prairie pothole lake and tulip lake having um, skill which is much higher than climatology. Um, compared to Crampton Lake, uh, this one in the middle here, where none of our models outcompete climatology. Also worth noting that the model class that is um, most skillful is not consistent. So for Suggs Lake, we saw our random forest and our profit model, but for our two prairie lakes, we see the process models uh, doing better. If we think about how this might translate into overall forecastability, if we compare all the models submitted at all of the sites, what we find is that, again, our Prairie Lake and um, Tulip Lakes um, have more models that are um, outcompeting climatology. And this is true across the forecast horizon with only Prairie Lake um, able to outcompete climatology across the full 30 days. Whereas Crampton Lake, there's no forecast horizon in which the models that we're seeing submitted actually outcompete climatology. Now, these are still quite preliminary findings, and we're still trying to do some analysis into what it is about these sites that makes them more or less forecastable. <coughs> OK, that's me. Go ahead. Uh, great. Uh, you know, that, that gives you an example of one um, that We've really, the Research Coordination Network has been able to engage early career researchers and you know, uh, provide them opportunity to kind of grow their, their you know, both science and leadership skills in terms of being champions for these different, um, these different themes and you know, really tried hard to support them in their work. And you can see some great 
uh, great synthesis that kind of that comes out um, that's you know influenced by the network because we're thinking about the analyses in, in, in similar wa similar ways, um, which helps us build this kind of cross synthesis cross theme synthesis which we're working towards. Um, and here's just an example of if you look at um, both Catherine and Freya's talks, some kind of early synthesis is climatology is hard to beat. You know, if you have observations at a site over a historical time period, um, that's pre a pretty good starting place uh, for an ecological forecast at the kind of the, the, the horizon or lead times that we're talking about here. But things like water temperature may be uh, better able to beat climatology than kind of a, you know, a more complex biological process uh, like phenology. So altogether, you know, this, this ecological uh, forecasting platform, um, you know, is really a, you know, a focal point to advance the field of ecological forecasting. You'll hear, you know, there are a lot of things that you can see that are, are uh, help advance the field beyond just the particular application of forecasting uh, neon data within this platform. For example, we've had to work through protocol standards and best practices uh, for, you know, uh, submitting forecasts and archiving forecasts. The training material and workshops has grown the field to and it help, has helped encourage diverse particip participate, participation. Um, there's been supporting software and cyber infrastructure that you know have applications beyond the challenge. Um, partner engagement um, through um, you know folks like the, the USGS and Neon and the National Phenology Network, um, and then finally this is also building up to kind of this multi forecast synthesis that will help add a body of knowledge uh, to the ecological uh, literature. And, you know, the, the growth that's come out of the challenge is both the people. Um, for example, we had a, a conference at NEON uh, this past June. Really, we, it was an unconference. So the, the participants got to kind of pick what they wanted to work on. And, you know, they, they picked projects that really kind of uh, centered around the forecasting challenge as a focal point, but weren't all just about forecasting a particular neon data product. There were some about viewing forecasting challenges through the lens of, of design justice. Um, there were others about you know, how best to um, kind of uh, improve, say, the Beatles theme, which has been got, you know, received some of the fewest submissions. What can we do to lower the barrier of entries to predicting some of the biodiversity elements? Those all kind of things came out of this meeting as well. And this community of forecast um, uh, people engaging in the enterprise of forecasting will persist long beyond uh, the research coordination network. Um, also, there's a whole uh, cyber infrastructure behind the scenes that is being made available um, where we uh, have the technology worked out to do the automated uh, components of the forecast. And this technology is being transferred to other elements. Um, for example, um, the uh, like, uh, other networks across the world are interested in using this for using forecasting challenges to engage folks um, in their particular data streams. So some challenges to the challenge, um, you know, basically, you know, how do we determine a winter, a winner in multi-dimensional space? Um, for example, you know, there's all these axes of time in the future or time of year or variable, and should we is a is an open question. Um, we also are having to overcome uh, inconsistent submissions. For example, if you submitted only your phenology forecast in the winter, you'll appear to do really well, as Catherine showed. But if you submit them during the time where there's the most change, it's the hardest to predict. And so inconsistent submissions by a particular forecasting team is something that we um, are working to overcome. Um, participation across all themes, we're really, um, you know, excited to kind of push boundaries of longer horizons, um, that year scale kind of level forecasting. The data latency for the non-sensor themes. Uh, there's been a lot of engagement in the sensor-based ones because you can actually run, which is something Freya did, where you ran a workshop on the beginning of a week-long conference and folks created forecasts. And then by the end of the conference, you could see five days of evaluation. Um, that's harder to do that. Uh, with the uh, the bio, more of the biodiversity uh, themes. And so that could be a re one of the reasons why the engagement has been lower. And then also uh, direct connection to decisions. Um, you know, uh, in, in this case, sort of like management, better tying to management decisions, whether it be management on sampling at a neon sites or 
uh, being able to transfer the knowledge and knowledge gained to ecosystems that are being more actively managed than, um, than, than the NEON sites. Some future directions are um, you know, synthesis, increased participation across themes, continue to reduce barriers through training tools and tutorials, adding additional themes like birds, uh, mosquitoes, uh, spatial uh, kind of forecasts, and then expanding beyond NEON to include other eons across the globe. And also thinking about adding more decision relevant targets. And as an example of that, um, here at Virginia Tech, we have a new um, uh, LTREB, long-term uh, research environmental biology site that is, is centering around uh, running a forecasting challenge on these two reservoirs that are uh, neighboring uh, each other um, in the Blue Ridge of uh, Virginia. And so we're under development of creating a forecasting challenge that builds on uh, the NEON forecasting challenge cyber infrastructure, and then actually feeds back and helps improve that uh, by because this is a, another case study that helps generalize the underlying framework that we're using. So with that, I think the question is how best can we you know, continue to leverage the NEON ecological forecasting challenge to help NEON achieve its 30 year mission? I think is a great open question for discussion. And so finally, you know, uh, we'd like to thank you um, for, for your um, uh, attendance and participation. We look forward to questions. And if you're interested in getting involved, uh, recommend uh, joining with uh, joining the Ecological Forecast Initiative, where the link here. Um, you can go to neonforecast.org to learn about how to submit forecasts. And you know, don't hesitate to reach out to me if you're interested in using neon forecasting challenge in your in your courses because it's uh, we have some you know best practices and some um, kind of guidance on how best to do that. And so I'll uh, you know we'll welcome uh, questions from the um, the attendees. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Quinn, Freya, and Catherine for a great talk. Virtual applause. Um, yeah, we have time for a few questions. So either you can use the Q&A button, so it's at the bottom of the Zoom window. You may have to mouse over to see the button. Or you can raise your hand, and we can unmute you, and you can ask a question. So we have one question so far in the question and answer box from Nick Harrison. It says, great talk. Can you speak briefly on what it would take to expand forecasting efforts to stream flow and discharge at Neon River and Lake sites? Uh, he's curious what that level of effort would be versus predicting temperatures in lakes, for example. You want to take a stab at that, um, Freya? Um, yeah, sure. Um, to start, I think it's a great idea. I feel like that's one reason we've had less participation in the the rivers side of the aquatics is that like discharge is like crucial for all of these water quality. And so like getting the forecast of discharge is going to help us in the water quality aspect as well. <clears throat> um, and I think one of the key questions is like the neon data availability for the for that um, variable. I would have to defer to Eric on that because I'm not 100% sure what that is. And like the data latency, we've seen it to be a big uh, like driver in participation. And so if the data latency is good and the data quality is good, then I don't see why it can't be expanded and would be a super exciting way to improve our other aspects of forecasting as well. Um, in terms of the model output and like how good the discharge models are for rivers and lakes, I would say they're probably less good than some of our water quality ones. The probably river hydrologists would probably disagree. Um, I think one of the like barriers to that is probably our precipitation forecasts that tend to be not so good as that. Like the things that drive lake temperatures, we're quite good at forecasting like air temperature and solar radiation. We're less good at forecasting precipitation, um, which is like a real driver of discharge. But I would be super excited to see a discharge forecast, even if it would just improve my lake forecast. <laughs> Thanks. And Nick said, whoops, I meant river and stream sites, but I think we get the idea. Um, yeah, the discharge data is interesting because that actually is um, a level four data set. Like there has to be quite a bit of processing for us to create it. So probably the latency would, it'd be hard to reduce the latency, I would think, but yeah, that's something we could talk to Nick about. 
Um, okay, we have another question. How much do the ecological forecasts depend on NOAA forecasts or long-term climate data? Just wondering about the implications of climate drives everything. And that, that, that's a great question. And we, um, you know, one of the types of analyses that we can do is we can actually apply the same scoring approach to, uh, you know, how good are the weather forecasts at the sites and see whether the kind of the, the forecasts, ecological forecasts degrade, um, you know, faster or slower than the weather forecast degrade um, as, you know, the horizon increases. And so we can actually directly ask that question. Not every model that's submitted forecasts to the challenge uses NOAA, um, you know, uses weather forecasts as inputs. And so it's not like a requirement to a model. And so if those models um, do, do, you know, do better um, or, you know, perform as well, then, you know, that can help also address that question. But, okay. but we, we are specifically making the NOAA forecast available because we know a priori that that is an important question People are going to want to drive their models with weather forecasts, and being able to address that the the question from the attendee is, is an important part of one of our objectives. All right. Um, real quick, before we go on to the next question, I'm going to put a link in the chat before folks take off, um, just again to the um, Beyond Seeing Seminar webpage in case anyone wants to go there and nominate speakers for the future, see the info for the forecasting data skills. Um, <clears throat> webinar that we're having at the end of October um, and all the other good stuff there. So just putting it back there for people. Okay, we have um, a multi-part question from Wayfine. Uh, I have two console questions and one application question. In the first section, Quinn, what did you mean by bias when you showed the standard deviation graph? Uh, in the second, in, in the first section from Catherine, what did you mean by skills? And then three is, could you please explain the classroom lessons a bit? I want to incorporate those uh, to my class this semester. Thanks. Okay. Uh, given the, the time we have remaining, I'll try to be brief. Uh, bias meant the central tendency of the probability distribution <clears throat> was not the, the, the observations did not fall on, their, on, on the central tendency of the observation of the distribution. So a normal distribution has a mean and a standard deviation. The it, how wrong was you know was your forecasted mean? That's the bias, and then the spread is the spread of the normal distribution that you use to forecast. Um, and so bias is just the difference between the observation and the mean of your uh, of your forecast. Um, I'll go ahead and jump to the the lesson plans a bit. Um, we we have a bunch a bunch of different approaches that we can point to, um, both through the Macro Systems um, Eddy program that provides kind of online. Uh, like uh, GUI interfaces for doing forecasting to learn about forecasting. And then you dive a little bit deeper by uh, using one of Freya's modules um, to kind of submit forecasts um, using our code. And then um, we have examples of courses that have then built on that to build more complex ecological models for forecasting. Um, but don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, about those, uh, about how to use it in a class. And I'll hand it over to Catherine. Forecast scale, this meant how good the forecasts were at forecasting. So higher skill meant they were, their forecasts were better, lower skill were worse forecasts. All right, I think we're gonna wrap it up here. Um, we're coming up on the hour. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, so again, check out the uh, Science Seminar webpage for future seminars and data skill seminars, and again, Let's thank our speakers, uh, Quinn Thomas, Catherine Wheeler, and Freya Olson. Thank you so much. Virtual applause. Yeah, thanks everyone for attending. This was great. <laughs>